So thank you so much, everyone, for coming. My name is Dr. Colleen Ehrlich, and it is my honor to be the president of CAGT, as well as hosting this session tonight. Um, with us, we have got Dr. Susan Daniels. And she is an internationally recognized expert in the field of gifted education and creativity, formerly a professor of educational psychology. She is now associate dean and core faculty of the Bridges Graduate School of Cognitive Diversity and Education. Susan is also educational director of the Summit Center, where she, which specializes in the identification and development of the creative potential across the lifespan. Dr. Daniels is the author of Visual Learning and Teaching, an Essential Guide for Educators K-8, co-author of Raising Creative Children, and co-editor and co-author of Living with Intensity. And tonight, she is joining us speaking about nurturing creativity in children and youth. So welcome, Dr. Daniels. We're so excited to have you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you a little bit before we started here. And I'm here to talk about some of my favorite favorite topics. So thank great, you. Great. Um, so we can go ahead and get started if you want to share your screen. Um, and then I will turn my video off, but know that I'm just right here. Okie dokie. You know what, though? This is I need to put this on slideshow, correct? Yep and play from start. There we go. Perfect. Nurturing creativity in children and youth. Thank you, Colleen. Um, so let's see. Um, I just wanna start by sharing with you that the material in this presentation is anchored in uh, one of my books. And that's uh, was co-authored with my colleague, Dr. Dan Peters, and it's Raising Creative Kids. I'm going to circle back around to this at the end of my talk because there's a new version of this book coming out with a new title and, and um, quite a bit more content. Um, so here we go. Um, a premise that I use in all of my work, um, actually in my, in my life, uh, professionally and personally, I believe wholeheartedly that, and this is an informed belief um, through research and experience, that everyone has creative potential. And um, when I'm giving talks to parents or I'm doing workshops with teachers, I, um, I, ask, I ask folks to play along with me and just chant this with me a few times. You know, everyone has creative potential because if you say it, it's more likely that you believe it. <laughs> You know, if you say it a few times, that reinforces it even more. Um, so human beings are born with the, barring, you know, um, severe learning disabilities or trauma, okay? But generally speaking, human beings are born with the innate capacity for creative activity. And, um, you know, I think about a Piagetian approach to um, early childhood development. And, you know, Piaget said that all children are scientists and artists. And um, I love this slide. I won't read the whole thing to you, but um, I said, you know, let's think about young children in, in preschool into kindergarten. And they're exploring and questioning and wondering and experimenting, inventing, visualizing, dreaming, uh, exaggerating, right? And transforming um, each and every day. They know how to be creative. Young children know how to be creative. Um, they approach their, their world um, in, different, in different modalities and in, in different processes as explorers and artists and architects and actors. Um, and I said this already, that they use the, they, they, they act in the world as scientists and artists and they use the skills of those domains naturally. So that's something that we can build on and foster. It's important to note that research has consistently shown, um, this was a colleague of mine, um, Dr. Kim from William and Mary, who conducted a, a large scale study and um, tracking uh, cre creative behavior in children in the primary grades and then up until into the intermediate grades. And she found, and the research was repeated, that by fourth grade, creativity dwindles 
Um, and we know this experientially, right? You know, kids will go from drawing anything and saying, oh, look, it's a horse, <laughs> you know, and it's a horse in a field of 10 foot daisies or, you know, whatever. And, and they start tearing, and it's not just about art, but they start tearing their work up and saying, it's just not right. This is not good. This is not what I want it to be. And they get more um, adult identified and uh, approval seeking. And, you know, so they'll ask, is this right? Does this look good? And when you put that evaluative piece in, it naturally suggests that there's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do, perhaps a wrong way to do things. And so that's setting up an external standard instead of the, the internal um, creative impulse of the child leading the way. Excuse me for just a second. So with all that teachers and parents have to do and with all the challenges in the world that we're dealing with right now, why nurture creativity? That's exactly why. Um, creativity enriches our quality of life. It stimulates growth and learning and it enhances happiness and meaning. And I wanna share with you that in a lifespan um, de development literature, uh, individuals who are engaged in, in personally satisfying creative, creative endeavors um, have overall better psychological and physical health. Um, so creativity makes life fun, contributes to problem solving, which goodness knows we need problem solving now. Um, and it maximizes developmental potential, intellectual, creative, affective domains interact. Um, I wanna say something here about creativity contributing to problem solving because I was having a conversation with Colleen before we started here and um, she said something about creativity and problem solving and critical thinking being taught, you know, like as an add-on or as an extra or as an enrichment process. Um, but it's important to take creativity and problem solving and connect the creativity and problem solving to the regular curriculum and to um, subject matter content so that students understand that, that these higher level skills can be applied across domains. Um, so if, if like me, you're someone who spends time studying or working with the development of creativity. Inevitably, um, you'll come across what are what are called in the literature the four P's of creativity, and they are person, process, product, and press. And I've been talking about person, process, product, and press for all of my career, twenty plus years, more than that, really, uh, and. I've, I've explained time many times that press refers to the environment. And it took me until fairly recently to realize that um, the four Ps would just as uh, well be person, process, product, and place. You know, it's what, what's going on in the environment that what might scaffold and support creativity or squelch it. So just a minute, I need to move my little thumbnail so I can see this. Um, so when we talk about uh, creativity and at the person level, we're looking at um, unique characteristics that contribute to creative outlook and to a creative personality. And then creative processes are the thinking skills, cognitive processes, methods, and techniques. Um, there are skills that can be taught create creative thinking skills that can be taught and that can be used across um, various subject matter and used in one's personal life. Um, there are some literature about um, flexible thinking in, in adolescents and um, adolescents who, who are flexible thinkers tend to thrive to a greater extent in adolescence than in adolescents than adolescents who are more rigid um, and um, inflexible in their thinking. Um, products pertain to things that are made, performances or tangibles, but products can also be ideas and stay at the level of the idea 
And that's fine because sometimes one idea, right, will snowball into the next and the next and then perhaps become a product or not. Um, this says that products are ideas, performances, or tangibles that are both novel and purposeful. And that quali qualification of novel and purposeful comes from Dr. Howard Gardner, whom you may know as um, the man who developed the theory of multiple intelligences. He was also an expert in creativity. And he said that creativity needed to be novel and purposeful because otherwise it could just be something bizarre, like I could decide to stand on my head and give the rest of my talk, which wouldn't which would be novel, but it wouldn't be particularly purposeful because especially being virtual, you'd see my feet, right? Um, <laughs> so I, you know, I kind of, I think that's an important concept to think about, but I also want to put a caveat on that. And that's that sometimes um, creative work doesn't appear to be purposeful. Um, or it doesn't appear to be purposeful at the time that it is created. Like, um, I, I'm a fan of Leonardo da Vinci. And Leonardo da Vinci, you may well know, in addition to being an artist, was an inventor. And he kept copious notebooks of inventions like that were very similar to submarines and helicopters and all sorts of things that we have today. And his peers at the time thought he was a bit batty, you know, and that those were not purposeful designs because they weren't realistic. Okay, and then press or place is the nature of the environment and how it supports, shapes, or suppresses creative activity. Oops, I need to forward this. Okay, so first I want to talk about char characteristics of creativity. Um, again, person, process, product, and place. So when I was a doctoral student, and I was researching creativity, I was particularly interested in characteristics of the creative person and how those might be supported as, um, you know, in a classroom setting or, you know, as, as, an, as an educator, what I could do. Um, and, and so it's interesting. Uh, one of the, the foremost characteristics of people who ex express and display creativity is that they're aware of creativeness. They're aware of uh, creativity in the environment and they're aware of their own creativity to some extent or another. And they choose to seek out creative opportunities and they choose to find and notice creativity in the environment, whereas there are others, and we see this in children who it's like, you know, uh, too much overwhelm. I just want things to be this way. And, and that's how, you know, that's how I'll proceed. Um, creative individuals are original and imaginative. Um, and that imagination connects to uh, visual thinking. So a number of studies that I've read have, have talked about for, um, for instance, musicians who talk about seeing and hearing the music all around them. And um, uh, there's synesthesia is a part of creativity for some people and that's cross-modal um, experiencing. So the imagination connects, for instance, certain words or phrases with colors or certain um, tastes with shapes. And that, that is a step towards um, using imagination creatively. Creative people tend to be independent. They want to do things their own way. Um, creativity is about being divergent, being a little different. And that takes courage. That takes courage, especially, I think, as, as uh, students go into middle school and there's um, pressure to sort of conform to the group. Risk taking is a part of creativity. And um, back to Leonardo da Vinci, when he was young, he built a pair of wings and jumped off um, his family's barn. That's the story anyhow. And the story goes that there was a big pile of hay underneath, underneath the, um, where he jumped, thank goodness. So, you know, the, the risk taking involved in an act like that is, in, is, is related to the belief that what you're doing is going to work. And I'm gonna take this risk because 
I want to do this creative thing. Now, in, in terms of children, we want to encourage risk taking because that stretches one towards um, optimal development and, and stretching oneself. But we also, of course, need to keep children safe. So there's always that, that balance. Creative individuals tend to have high energy and especially high energy around their passions. You know, um, children or us, when, when we're deeply engrossed in something that we love, perhaps gardening, so you're designing a new garden, you can spend hours digging in the dirt and planting and designing, you know, how you're going to arrange your garden. And, and you don't realize how much time has passed because you're in a, in a state of, of flow and you're immersed in that activity. Um, oops. Um, creative people tend to be curious. And uh, when I've talked about this at times in the past, I've said, you know, the intense curiosity of, of that goes along with creativity is um, I've called it the perpetual toddler synd syndrome. You know, toddlers are always asking why, but why, but how come? Can we do it this way? And that that questioning of norms or questioning of how things are done carries through the lifespan of creative individuals if, if it's not squelched, of course. Creative individuals tend to be very sensitive and this sensitivity can be emotional sensitivity, but it, it's also very likely a sensitivity to nuances in the world around them. So textures matter and textures can be delightful or they can be irritating. Colors can be delightful or they can be irritating. Um, you know, the sensitivity goes both ways in terms of appreciation, but also in terms of um, sometimes overwhelm. Creative individuals tend to have a sense of humor. And that's the thing that I wanna say, I just said tend to have. So I'm, I'm just sharing with you about a dozen characteristics that are commonly associated with creativity, but no creative individual well, or few creative individuals will have all of these characteristics. And I think they're somewhat fluid too. The characteristics may be part and parcel of the person, but more prominent in certain settings or at different, involved in different activities or at different times in their lives. Um, Excuse me one more time. Creative individuals tend to be attracted to complexity. And if something isn't complex, and you may, may relate to this with your students or your own children, if something isn't complex, if, they, if the creative individual child starts becoming bored, oftentimes they'll create their own complexity, right? They'll take a task and they'll make it much more difficult or much more involved than it needs to be because that's part of their creative process. And then that last one, artistic, you know, um, creativity is often associated with the arts, but creativity touches all human endeavors and all domains. There's creativity in math, there's creativity in science, there's creativity in construction. Um, hopefully you want a sound foundation and, you know, when you're involved with architecture or <laughs> construction. Um, and you want your brain surgeon to follow certain principles of surgery. But if something comes up that's unexpected, you want some flexibility and, um, and um, adaptability. Back to artistic. So the thing that I was trying to say is that saying artistic doesn't mean that, uh, that an individual is necessarily involved in the arts per se, although they may be. But actually, I, I should put a slash there and put artistic slash aesthetic. And um, I think the aesthetic piece is more universal. It's, it's that um, creative individuals tend to notice um, with their senses and, and again, be aware of their environment and what appeals to them and, and what doesn't. <clears throat> um, cre creative individuals tend to be open-minded. And in fact, uh, next to awareness of creativity, open-minded might've been the better as the second characteristic that we talk about because that's you know that's that's key open-mindedness relates to cognitive flexibility flexibility in your thinking versus cognitive rigidity and so being open-minded and not necessarily accepting anything and everything but considering a range of possibilities having the the, the perspective of being willing to consider 
uh, different points of view and different ways of doing things. Interestingly too, creative individuals tend to be thorough. Now they're thorough with their projects. Uh, you know, I, I had a conversation once with someone who says, you know, people will say, well, they won't do their, this child won't do his or her work. And it's not that they won't do their work. It's that they don't necessarily want to do our work, you know, the school work, but they may have their own passion projects that they'll, again, have high energy for and devote great amounts of time to. Um, pers being perceptive sort of relates to being sensitive. It's, um, having insight into others and to the environment and to processes and activities, um, nuance, having an awareness of nuance. Creative individuals tend to be deeply emotional. And, um, you know, that, that, that can fall along a, a range or a continuum. Um, being emotional can be a, a really good thing. Being sensitive to others, being sensitive to others' feelings, being aware of others' feelings, being aware of one's own feelings, and being able to articulate that. Um, and it can mean dealing with overwhelm of one's own emotions. The, in, the internal milieu, you know, the internal psychological experience um, coupled with creativity and, and emotionality can be can be delightful and delicious, but it can also be overwhelming. And um, it is not uncommon at all for creative individuals to have a strong ethical nature and to think about what, how what they do would impact the world. And so oftentimes they may be thinking about um, whatever project they're taking on or, or getting involved in and, and how that might be structured in such a way that it could do do good for someone else. Okay, so we talked about the four Ps. Now I want to talk about um, the four Cs. So the, the four Cs of creativity are looking at um, types of creativity, or perhaps I wouldn't quite call these levels of creativity, although I don't know that it would be wrong to call them levels either. Um, so the four C's are mini C, little C, pro C, and big C. And this is significant in studying and talking about creativity because about 15 years ago in the literature, you wouldn't have necessarily seen little C or pro C. Um, mini C and big C would be discussed. So mini C uh, refers to everyday acts of personal creativity. And this is a type of creativity that I'm particularly interested in because I believe it's the juicy sort of creativity that you can find in everyday life that can enrich one's own life um, across the lifespan. So that can relate to changing a recipe, imaginative play. Um, here, this box is really a castle and I want you to be the, the dragon and I'll be the knight or the princess or whatever. Um, and then building a new Lego vehicle without the directions, changing it up completely. Um, and then we'll look at Big C in contrast. Big C is a level of creative work that changes the field with future and lasting impact. So it's major earth, sh earth shaking uh, sig significant work along the lines of Thomas Edison, uh, Albert Einstein, Martha Graham, um, I have a feeling Amanda Gorman, our poet, is going to have this kind of significant impact on our world. Sigmund Freud, Georgia O'Keeffe, and Virginia Woolf. Maya Angelou, um, who else? Yeah, that's good. All right, so then mini C, or mini C, um, now with the 4C model, we look at little c creativity, which is developing creativity through de deliberate activity writing a story, making a garden, choreographing a dance, restoring a car. Um, little c creativity is what I would want to help teachers um, integrate across the curriculum, having options for projects and ways for students to show what they know and explore um, their knowledge through creative uh, means.
Professional creativity is earning a living or spending a majority of one's time in creative pursuits, writing, architecture, graphic design, a patent inventor, which is um, what Albert Einstein was. Um, and so I live in California and I spend part of the year in Southern California and part of the year in Northern California. And in Southern California, Los Angeles has the whole um, film industry, which is, has so much creativity beyond, you know, acting, directing, the technical end, uh, camera work, et cetera, et cetera, script writing. And in Northern California, um, there's Silicon Valley with all of the, the you know, uh, technology um, creativity. So I, I mentioned that because there's a man by the name of Richard Florida, and he wrote two books some time ago. He wrote uh, a book titled Creative Cities and a book titled The Creative Class. And Creative Cities was about sort of epicenters of creativity, which um, uh, the Bay Area and Los Angeles, I don't mean to be <laughs> saying just California, but this is what I know, you know, but there are, there are environments and um, uh, DU, you know, any, almost any university will have um, creative work going on. And it is, it's more common now for individuals to need creativity in their professional lives. The other thing, this is another topic for another time. I think I sort of already mentioned this, but we have we have enormous challenges in our world right now, and they are not going to be solved by doing the same thing the same way and expecting different results. So um, we need we need highly intelligent people, very educated people, and we need um, people to to be who are divergent thinkers and can use creativity for problem solving. Oops. Okay, so um, creative activities, projects and products. Um, oops, excuse me. So um, Colleen and I were talking about how to integrate creativity in different subject matter areas. I probably said that three or four times now. And I think that's really important because I don't think creativity should be a little satellite that's floating over here. Um, creative, taking creative approaches enriches all learning. And so I think, I, I know as a professor, as an educator that integrating creativity across the curriculum is really good for all learners, really good for all learners. It sparks interest, it sparks engagement, it sparks enthusiasm, and it's really, really essential for gifted learners. They need um, scaffolding to, um, you know, analysis, creativity, synthesis, evaluation, the higher order thinking skills, and they need the ability to express what they know in different forms. So, while I've said creativity is not directly linked to art, it, um, you know, so, and, and I want to expand on that a little bit. It's like, well, how can creativity and art not be the same thing? And I, I did some research at a school, high school for the visual and performing arts in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a few, several years ago. And, um, all of the students there had to submit a portfolio and and other um, you know letters of recommendation like but their portfolio needed to show evidence of artistic ability what was really interesting is is that not all of those portfolios were necessarily really creative there was a type of art student who was good at at reproducing um, excuse me i'm going to shut my door sorry So I'm, I'm recalling one art student in, in particular who drew with great um, precision and specificity, <laughs> oh dear, um, but was not creative. I mean, he just, he took, he took 
um, very literal re re representations of things that already existed and, 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 and um, illustrated in great details, but he didn't do anything novel or unique. Um, so that's a very interesting, an interesting um, thing, you know. Um, so making, a, making and illustrating a book, writing a book, creating a collage. Um, I've had, so, I, so I'm um, the educational director at the Summit Centers where we um, assess gifted and twice exceptional, gifted creative and twice exceptional youth. And um, we counsel and coach um, throughout the lifespan. And numerous individuals that I've worked with over the last several years um, create comics or cartoons and um, one of the teachers that I'm working with right now is creating a graphic novel for her student. She teaches writing and she's creating a graphic novel about the writing, about imagination and coming up with ideas in the writing process. So, you know, we might think of comics as being kind of frivolous, but it's really quite amazing what can be illustrated um, in just a few drawings and something that I would do when I was working with younger students is I would have a three panel just three boxes and then a line under each one and so it was a three panel um, comic cartoon and beginning middle and end and I would ask students to you know cartoon the beginning middle and end of a story that they read or a book that they read and they love it and it's just it's another way it's a way to infuse creativity and it's another modality um, for youth to show what they know. So a design, a future scenario, an improvisation, um, invention. When I, when I was both in a school district and also when I was uh, full-time at a different university, Cal State San Bernardino, we had an invention convention every year. And so in the local school districts, um, teachers would take, would, do an invention unit with their kids and the kids would identify a problem and then um, create an invention and then bring come to the university and it was kind of like a science fair but it was an invention convention and one of the ones that pops into mind um, right now as I'm talking is there's, there's this boy who created an umbrella hat um, and what was interesting is you know he actually created the model and wore it to the invention convention, but they had a full process of illustrating um, their invention and then writing about what the problem and the need was and how this met it and how it would be built and what, you know, et cetera. So there was a lot of um, analysis and imagination and evaluation and creativity that went into this whole process. Um, there was drawing and there was writing so you got a, got at a lot of um, core skills that need to be developed, but through our very creative way. Um, I ran enrichment programs at the university too. And um, we had many different topics that could be studied. And we had, a, we had a video class and that was one of our, one of our most popular, I have a, um, graduate student that I'm working with right now, who is um, teaching literature through, through um, making videos. A musical score, a play, obviously, skits that go along with um, literature. I love the use of posters. Again, so much can be displayed in a poster. And again, working with the two modalities of visual and verbal. And that has, a, that has a very solid rationale behind it. I mean, conferences at the university level and beyond will have poster sessions where individuals create a poster on their topic and they stand there and um, people can come by and view their posters and read and then talk to the individual and ask questions. So um, we, I, at, at various settings that I've worked with, we've had um, poster sessions, poster conferences skits again, um, making a speech. Storyboard is very similar to a comic, but it's um, usually quite a bit lengthier. And then of course, creating a website. 
Um, and the thing they want to say about this too, is that um, creativity is enriched by group participation as well. So for a website, you might have someone who's particularly good with visuals, you might have someone who's particularly good with technology, and you might have someone who's particularly good with writing. And then that a collaboration can be formed. So in addition to being creative in this, in this setting, they're thinking visually, they're thinking verbally, they're using technology and, and they're learning skills of collaboration and problem solving. So again, I'm trying to make a case for creativity, not being a fluff or an extra or something that's out there, but something that, that is meaningful and that enriches and extends learning um, for potentially for all students. And, you know, personally, I think teachers should have some fun with creativity too. Okay. So uh, creative press is the fourth P. And um, creative press is again, the, the, the um, impact or effect of the environment and just baseline for creativity to flourish and for children to learn, for children to feel safe, there, there needs to be psychological safety within the classroom. And that goes right back to um, some of the characteristics that I mentioned earlier, particularly risk-taking, you know, if you're going, or independence, if you're gonna do something that's a little different, if you're gonna, you're, you're gonna um, step outside of the box, if you will, it needs to be, there needs to be acceptance of that and in fact, some encouragement of that. Creativity consciousness relates back to the one of the first characteristics that I talked about, being aware of creativity. So some teachers would come into my graduate classes on creativity and say, well, I'm not very creative. And you know, I believe everybody's creative, but I wouldn't necessarily press that. But I would say that, you know, just, just come on in and, and give it a try and um, see what you think. And so if we in incrementally address creativity, embrace creativity, encourage creativity, we don't have to be like super creators ourselves to be able to facilitate creativity in others. It's about being open-minded and, and encouraging without um, setting, stand setting um, black and white standards. And then there needs to be opportunities to create. So again, in terms of curriculum, if projects can be developed or opportunities for responding to the curriculum in creative ways can be integrated, that's going to be, I believe, probably the most sustaining for create kids who are have a strong creative drive, but also for nurturing that creativity on an ongoing basis. It doesn't have to be a, oh, let's let's do a creative activity now. If if you think about some of the things that we've talked about here, you think about some of the characteristics of creativity and you know just sort of consciously be aware of them so that you can say, oh, that was that was an imaginative thought, Nathan. Thanks for sharing it. And um Susan, how do you how do you want to uh, what what kind of a project do you want to mini project do you want to create in response to the story that your group is reading and so on opportunities to create and opportunities are are can be found everywhere and and they can be small you know I mean if uh, just 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 take a little step out into trying on possibilities with yourself and with your students. And that's gonna be boosting creativity right there. Okay, so I'm a little early. I must've talked faster than I intended to. <laughs> um, this is my last slide. And um, so this is, I told you that the book that I would circle back around and that um, this presentation was based on the book, Raising Creative Kids. Well, highlighted there in light blue, there's a new book coming out. Um, it's a version of this book, but it's updated. It's got much more content in it. And it's um, titled Boosting Your Child's Natural Creativity, Go, circling back around to that um, underlying premise of all, all of us have creative potential. And that will be out in June. I also want to share because um, 
it, as I mentioned, there's a there's a strong connection between visual thinking and creativity. I have a book out that's titled uh, Visual Learning and Teaching, An Essential Guide for Educators K-8. And this is published by Free Spirit. And there's just loads of um, strategies in here that are about visual thinking. But if, if I were to look through it, I would say probably 82%. <laughs> <laughs> are also creative activities and strategies as well. So we have time for questions or discussion. Yep, perfect. Thank you so much, um, Susan. And we absolutely have some questions. Okay. Um, so we'll just have you stop sharing your screen so people can see a little bit better. Perfect. And um, the first question, so this question is from membership. And the question is, um, uh, it's a big one. Uh, my child is highly visual spatial, very sensitive and very creative. How can I continue to support that creativity when, as they get older, obtaining an education demands more structure and rigidity? Is there a way to balance it without squashing them? Yes. <laughs> so here's the thing. You know, I'm hoping, I always hope that teachers are embracing some creativity and valuing it and, and bringing it into the classrooms. Um, but depending on the nature of the child and what their interests are and what their, how their creativity uh, emerges, inevitably it, it's going to, you know, I, I wrote Raising Creative Kids to help parents understand creativity along the lines of what we're discussing here tonight but also um, strategies for how to nurture their child's creativity. And, you know, I, I raised a son and I also had a minor in adolescent psychology. So I know that, you know, in the middle school and high school years, sometimes um, kids aren't as fond of doing things with parents or with the family. But if you make a tradition of engaging in creative activities, sometimes that can be sustaining even during difficult times. It's like, for instance, what we're going through now and or challenging developmental times like adolescence. So um, one of the things, one of the strategies um, in the book talks about family field trips and that everybody gets a turn. You know, it may, it, perhaps one, one afternoon a week, it's time set aside for family field trips. And that can be anything from going to a museum, going to a film, if we can do those things, to taking a hike, um, taking a hike and taking a sketchbook with you. And for any, for any, really anyone, when I, when I taught middle school a bazillion years ago, <laughs> um, I gave my students an eight and a half by 11 artist book. They're black covered with really high quality paper. So there's no bleed through. And I told my students they didn't necessarily have to write, but I wanted them to complete one page every day. Do just fill it, do something expressive. And I told them that they were going into adolescence and that this was an incredible time in their life. And I, and I wanted them to document it. So they were sort of doing a creative self-study. So that's how I use that with adolescents. But Young children love having a blank book and knowing that they can, that it can be their journals or that they can create a book. And so that's a very simple way of honoring and acknowledging and uh, fostering creativity. The other thing I, I think that's very important uh, for parents is if you can try to cultivate that creativity consciousness about yourself. And if you are creative, you know, if you feel that you're engaged in creative activities, talk about that openly in the family. And if you don't feel that you're nurturing your creativity, um, I'd say try, try to find five to 10 minutes every day to do something that pleases you, makes you happy and is creative. And that's modeling for the, for the children. It's one of the best things that we can do. I love it. And I think, you know, circling back when you had said that there are enormous problems that need to be solved, um, and that hope that 
um, teachers are integrating the creativity and then also through that modeling aspect at home are huge because you know we think about the problems that we have to solve in this world and I was reflecting back on that characteristics list that you had yeah. and um, yeah those are all the that's the, the people who are solving the problems we need them to have those characteristics and so it is of the utmost importance that we as educators and parents are um, cultivating those in just all of our young people. So we had a couple other questions in the chat. Um, so first we had a couple of questions um, around equity. So um, one piece being when you're looking at these things, and I believe that it was talking about what we were talking about in terms of like making sure that um, that creativity is embedded in those content areas as well as those characteristics. Um, do you think about equitable practices at all? And what or whom are you using to measure creativity? <laughs> all from the all from those that equity lens. So I think first, like how how are you thinking about equity in terms of your work around creativity? And then um, what or whom are you using to measure? Well, okay, that's a big, that's such a big question. And my mm -hmm. mind's going like yeah. seven different directions at the same time. Okay, um, I'll just give an example. When I was a gifted program coordinator in rural Wisconsin, we had um a very uh, an unusually diverse um student body in in wisconsin um and that was in no small part um because of uh, migrant farm workers and i had a huge eye-opening experience with along with teachers there because um, well, okay, so uh, an instrument that I use to assess creativity is the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking, and it's a visual assessment of creativity. And there are prompts, there are little squiggles, boxes with little squiggles and, and um, indi individ individuals have the instruction to create an image and elaborate the image to, sh to show and tell as complete a story as they can. And so th there's more to it than this and more detail than this, but many of the teachers were surprised at some of the creativity that was depicted by students who were English language learners and not, ne and not necessarily very forthcoming verbally in the classroom. That was pretty profound, you know? So I think the equity aspect comes about in the open-mindedness and the awareness of everyone potentially having creative potentials and seeking to find that that creative potential in all of our students um, i work with with i have worked with gifted and twice exceptional learners but creativity creativity in the literature uh, correlates with iq up to 120 and then it bursts apart so creativity correlates with intelligence up to just just where we'd be looking at and please don't don't think that i'm a huge advocate of intelligence testing that's a whole nother discussion for another time but we use it and so but my point is that that creativity isn't about intellectual or academic giftedness. You know, creative potential can emerge in a very, um, you know, average but capable student and in, in students who have disabilities and challenges. And in fact, if we provide opportunities equitably with all of our students, you know, I'm not saying let's do a pull out because here are 10 bright students or here are six students that have notable creativity. If we know that students are creative, some, you know, some people are just naturally wired to be more creative, but again, everybody has creative potentials. So if we've got three or four students and we know they're intensely creative, I think it's incumbent upon us to 
give them opportunities to engage in their creativity, but also to think about that little mini C and little C of what can we do equitably to provide opportunities for engaging in creativity on a daily basis. And again, you know, there's psychological and mental health benefits of, of engaging in creativity. So that's really an equitable uh, pro process because so many of our students who are challenged or are coming from low, low socioeconomic backgrounds, they're not having enrichment at home, you know? And so they need, they need opportunities um, such as these in the regular school day. Colleen, did that answer the question? Yeah, I think, and I think, I mean, I think it's, I think it does. And I think it's the hard piece is with creativity is, um, like when you see it, you know you're seeing it. And how do we measure it? Oh, I think okay. that that was the other piece. Okay. Yeah. So um, at the Summit Center, we use a couple of different ways to get at creativity. And a very simple um, thing that we, strategy that we use is giving parents um, the Torrance checklist of creative positives. And so it's a checklist basically that, that um, parallels the characteristics that I've talked about here today. And so parents and or teachers can fill this out and say, I see this quality. And it'll, I'm getting a, I'm getting a um, you said you got your words tied up earlier. I'm getting mine tied up right now because I want to, I want to say like two hours worth of stuff in the next five minutes. But anyhow, um, so the Torrance checklist has, let's say, um, artistic okay and so the child draws the child um it has an aesthetic sense the child loves music um you know and so there's a there's a main characteristic and then underneath it there are four or five different related aspects and it's just a checklist it's not a likert scale you don't do one through five you just say yes i see this characteristic in this child that is an instrument that every teacher could use for every kid potentially. I mean, it's just every child. It's just, it's just, it gets at this and, and, and it's not time intensive. It doesn't require trainings. Um, I love the Torrance test of creative thinking, the visual test. And that's, and that is what I use when I can. The problem with the Torrance test or a problem with the Torrance test is that you have to be trained to score it and it's a five day tra training. So I'm trained, um, but you can use the Torrance test. And I think it's a, it's a doodle test. It's a drawing test. Doesn't require artistic ability. I wish I had some samples, but you know, you can show wildly creative ideas and very simple drawings. So it has three parts and um, it's really inexpensive. I think the test itself is like $7.50 or $10 a piece. And you can send it to Scholastic Testing Service and they have scorers. Mm -hmm. So if you really think, I want to get at creativity, or I've got these five, five children that I think are really creative, you could use the Torrance test, send it off and have it scored and get this full report back that talks about multiple dimensions, flex, fluent thinking, flexible thinking, elaboration, originality, problem solving, storytelling, et cetera. Um, might, might be something that you want to do just... Um, as a pilot to see what kind of information you get back. It's really enlightening. Oh. <laughs> we have time for one more. So I'm okay. just, we have a couple more. So I'm just picking this one because I think this one is really kind of talking about what you were talking about earlier in terms of just like our general situation and knowing just some of the um, angst and social emotional pieces that our students are going through at home and at school or lack thereof school, depending on where it is that you're located exactly. But um, somebody asked, based on your experience, when is, oops, and somebody just put it in, so let me see, sorry. <laughs> the chat just went down for a second. Um, based on your experience, when is the most creative time under sadness and boredom or when students are happy and learning? So is there any correlation? Like when are people the most creative? So are they creative, more creative here or more creative more here? More creative under times of sadness and boredom or when students are happy and learning? Yes. <laughs> Good answer. That's a, yes, that's a both and not an either or. And it really depends on the individual child and the circumstances. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think again, 
if we make, I, I go back to having a journal and visually expressing oneself in the journal as well as, as verbal. And, you know, young people can do that, can engage in that sort of activity when they're joyous and jubilant. And it can also be a place of solace to go write and draw and, and create and express, express their emotions, especially if they're not ready to share them with others or they don't necessarily have the vocabulary at that given time to be able to express themselves to others. It's, a, it's an avenue to get you know, thoughts and feelings externalized. Or as has happened to both of us tonight, we can't get our words right. Yeah, no. <laughs> For those right words and what you're trying oh, to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you so much to, for everyone for joining. Um, Dr. Daniels, thank you so much for joining us tonight and just for everything you do for gifted children every single day. Um, it is and, my pleasure and I'm glad to know you. Yeah, it, <laughs> vice versa. Um, so thank you, everybody. We look forward to having you back here next week. I know. And we are no longer live. All right. Thank you so much. That was amazing. I loved hearing it. You did <laughs> you did great. It was really um informative and yeah. It was well, great. Let me know if there's you know any follow-up or anybody, you know, yeah. wants to, I didn't say, I didn't mention my email, but you know, if if anybody talks to you about this presentation and has ideas or questions or concerns or whatever, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, just speaking for everyone, I think a, a huge piece moving forward that we'd love to have you back on is like, you know, really supporting that like teacher aspect of like, how do you completely yeah. embed creativity yeah. into those content areas? Because I think it's going to become a bigger, bigger issue, um, you know, as, uh, as that group begins publishing that research that I think they've talked about quite a bit, mm -hmm. um, that it's gonna, you know, there's gonna be more and more questions just across the field, um, especially people who haven't taken creativity classes, things like that on like, how do I do it? Like, and doing it in, in terms of, um, this isn't gonna come out totally the right way, but in a way where if my administrator walks in the room, I'm not gonna get in trouble. I know. Oh my gosh. And I say it as an I, I say it as an administrator, but it is a real thing. I know. I get and, it. Um, so I think, yeah. I have a question for you. Yeah. And I don't know that if you can help me with this, but I figure it's it's always worth asking, right? Um, I did not get a proposal in for NAGC. Yeah, so I'm not involved in that aspect of um, of it. I think um, I'm trying to think. Nanette has so um, Nanette and our past president have been going to like the NAGC. So I'm helping organize it, but Nanette and our our now current past president um because that you had to start going to those meetings like i don't know like a year or something ago yeah, yeah um sure. and so they might nanette might be able to help you more although i don't know that she's done any of the proposal reviews either okay so um i think you could maybe reach out to is it carolyn k was is like oh name? okay maybe i'll talk to nanette and find out who mm -hmm. who's you know who's the person to talk to about this and if i can't you know if i can't participate that's fine it's just are you uh, coming though i would love to um it's e it, it, you know it's easier for me to do that if i'm presenting yeah right? well you should come and we will have a glass of wine together girl <laughs> i would love that if i if i manage to make it there it's a plan. You, you, Norma, and I will have a glass of wine. Oh my gosh! <laughs> All right, I'm coming. I have to. Figure out um, and you know what? If I'm not able to do something at NAGC, perhaps I can do something more uh, with Norma. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thanks a bunch. Well, it was so nice to meet you. And I would love to do creativity in the classroom next year. So yeah, I think that'd be really awesome. All right. Have a good evening. Cool. All right. You too. Bye. Bye.